Hey, Thomas, it's uh, great to see you today. And, uh, you know, you're doing some amazing work with this focus group AI for Health. So let's get into a dialogue about it and so you can share some of your experiences and especially from the past week. Hi, Steve. Yeah, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, let's start. So, you know, Thomas, can you outline some of the top uh, milestones in your life professionally and then also, you know, some of your top leadership roles as well? Well, let me start with uh, the thing that I'm probably most known for, which is my role uh, in video compression. Um, in 2000, I have been appointed the Associate Rapporteur of uh, uh, ITU, uh, question six of study group 15. Um, we were able to actually produce uh, some things that actually are mattering today, uh, H264. Or MPEG AVC is now 80% of all the bits on the internet. Uh, just a, that was in 2003, uh, and in 2013, we produced uh, HEVC or H265, and now all 4K video is in that uh, format. And uh, uh, I was very fortunate to have been awarded the ITU 150 Award um, in 2015 at the 150th anniversary of the ITU. And, um, I could stand among uh, giants like Bob Kahn and, and others who have received the same award. So that's my, uh, the thing that I'm most known for. Um, I'm a professor at the Technical University of Berlin and uh, I have been actually publishing actively about my work. And uh, it turns out that Thomson Reuters named me in the list of most influential scientific minds. Um, as one of the most cited researchers in my field. And I've gotten some awards and, multi and best paper awards. And um, third, I'm, I was a, I'm a co-founder and an advisor to several startups. Some of them made it uh, with $100 million exits and some didn't. So uh, that's that. And then uh, I'm currently the executive director of the Fraunhofer Heinrich Hertz Institute. Uh, it's a research institute with about uh, 500 researchers and uh, it shows a steady growth and increased output and I'm very proud of everybody I'm working with. And last but not least, I just recently became this uh, chair of the focus group Artificial Intelligence for Health. And we are very excited about that and I guess we're going to be talking about that uh, more today. Yeah, I mean, it, again, amazing work. You, you have a just a quite a remarkable background and you're quite young too so <laughs> i'm always amazed uh, you know what are your top research interests and in the predicted outcomes and why so um the research field of the heinrich Hertz institute are um, machine learning and artificial intelligence as one obviously computer vision uh video coding um, and then communication topics like 5g optical fiber and visible light communication and uh, the nice thing about my university position and the institute's position is that the scope of our research uh, can range from basic research to uh, application uh, of our research to practical use cases. And um, the application areas that we can be active in are health, industry, mobility, entertainment, and we have lots of engagement with all of these. Uh, people have many, many thousands of projects a year. and uh, the aim for the institute is to actually produce technology for the digital transformation as this you know the, the, the digital model of the world in some way it will be one of the strongest driving forces for progress well again uh, just uh, find it so fascinating now, now these next questions are about this program the focus group ai for health and people are abbreviating this as the fg ai 4 h and it's kind of like a meme you know, how did the focus group come about and uh, what are the major organizations driving this global initiative? So the, the abbreviation uh, comes from the ITU. The ITU is in, likes abbreviations, <laughs> uh, but it's also good to have a term that you can search easily. Um, so at the AI for Good Summit in Geneva, May 15 to 17 in 2018, that you are also uh, co-organizing and I'm helping sometimes to find speakers, uh, we had an AI for Health session and uh, there were 15, 16, 17 projects being presented. We also have our AI for Health projects. We do proteomics, gate analysis, ECG analysis, EEG, etc. 
And with all of these projects, it was it became clear that they are limited to the data set uh, that was available to them. And then it wasn't clear what happened with the results and whatever came out uh, as an algorithm afterwards. So we saw that there would be a strong demand for a standard, um, in particular an evaluation, how well these AI methods are performing. Um, and we would basically have to apply this to health data and then see how well these algorithms are. So we then discussed this further and uh, we would basically say in order to bring AI to the global scale, we would first of all, you know, uh, need to identify use cases that are relevant to public and clinical health. Uh, we need to understand the data sources, like how are these data being sourced and we are, have created something to, to discuss that. Uh, we will then need to evaluate the performance of these uh, AI for health solutions. And we will then, at the end, having documented everything from the data sources to the use case, the ethical aspects, everything, and how well these are performing, uh, these can be used as uh, documents for recommendations, uh, like by WHO or national, national authorities. So why is it special? Well, the ITU is a UN specialized agency and it uh, provides the engineers in this. And WHO is uh, responsible for worldwide health. So if we combine the forces of engineers and health experts, uh, I think we are, have a chance to accomplish what we want to accomplish. I guess it's a really great combination of forces. You know, the World Health Organization definitely is number one in many aspects of public health worldwide. It's recognized as such for many, many years. And of course, the ITU is, is over 150 years old and has set many of the global standards that we just take for granted today. So a, a really a perfect combination of the two. And then you as chair, with you, especially with your tremendous background and the contributions you've made, you, know, you have those two Emmys in the background. I don't know if people can uh, see them, but uh, uh, you know, you, you, you've done some amazing work. So, and then of course your research background and a lot of it sort of practical basis to it. Uh, I, I think it's just a, a perfect storm, uh, as they say, it's sort, of, sort of a common term. Now, what problems are being solved? Well, let, let me give an example. So, um, worldwide, uh, there are thousands um, or millions of health workers are missing. Um, there's actually worse 1.7 billion people on this planet do not have a bank account, but 1.3 billion of them have a phone. So we could actually bring in uh, this in order to come up with new solutions to the health problem once it becomes a problem. And so, for instance, using telecommunications to provide uh, help health advice for example is something that we are looking at if we take a step back and look at the problem on a more generic scale uh, an ai algorithm in health to some degree uh, produces a mapping from data health data or environmental data or other data to something an output value that is relevant to health to health like an indication for uh, health situation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it may suggest uh, triage, uh, treatment decisions, etc. So, what the activities for this focus group is to basically find use cases for AI algorithms in the space, and then uh, see how well they are performing. So, how could we do this? This is what we are currently working on. Well, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a grand mission and uh, definitely will have a practical impact on the entire world going forward. So what are the activities of the focus group and specific outcomes from these activities? Well, first of all, we, uh, we have a structured activity. Structure is important to achieve something. Um, the first meeting we just had uh, 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 from 26 to 27 of uh, uh, September, uh, 25th of September, we had a workshop and uh, we were pleased to be able to have this meeting at WHO headquarters in Geneva. And uh, we had a 
uh, thrilling 130 participants and many are, have been listening in um, through remote participation. And uh, there was um, not only, I have to say, enthusiasm at the beginning, but there was also some skepticism whether this is actually possible, what we are discussing here. And so what we took is we took some real steps towards what we want to achieve by um, having a very constructive discussion at our first meeting. Um, we would basically uh, find a way to solicit uh, inputs to our next meeting, which will be uh, from 14th to 16th November in New York City. And uh, we would then basically issue documents that would start to describe the process that we are developing. The process is to um, request submissions on use cases for AI and health together with associated, associated data. We can go there in more detail. Um, we would then also have to tell only, not only which data we are accepting and which kind of algorithms. There are certain important rules and also what are we going to do if something gets submitted to us. All of that has to be laid out and has to um, put in, uh, in documents so that people can understand what uh, they are contributing to. Um, and so we have laid out our meeting plan um, until September next year. And uh, our third meeting at, at our third meeting at uh, DPFL in Lausanne in January next year. I hope we'll have some really important uh, progress because these standardized assessment methods then that we want to develop for AI for Health solutions, they would uh, help us to assure the quality of these methods. Then once your um, AI method is, is uh, evaluated in terms of quality, people start using it on a bigger scale. That would foster your adoption in practice. It would basically help you to get whatever you have developed out in the world on a massive scale. You would then be able to cre create more data and more turnaround and improve even your solution. And in this way, we hope that uh, some of the things that we are evaluating have a strong impact on global health. You know, it's an, it's an, an ambitious plan and one that will be carried out because just due to the parties involved. And uh, so how will the solution be achieved? So our, we had some first exchanges, and, and this is obviously uh, going, going to, to change over time, but in principle, what we want to do is we want to create standardized input data sets. So we ask people to submit data to us. Um, some of those data should be, should be open uh, so that people can understand the structure, the nature. Uh, we need a full description of how this data have been uh, gathered, and we also need uh, undisclosed data, because those undisclosed data would then be used for testing. So the data set contains not only um, input data to the AI algorithm, but it would also need to have confirmed output data. So if there's a uh, um, indication on a di diagnostic uh, 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 value, for example, we would need to have this to be confirmed afterwards. And so once we have split the data that we have into uh, the public, the open ones, and into the undisclosed ones, we will then create metrics for comparisons in health. A true, false, and a false, true can actually mean very, very different things. So we have to be very careful about that because uh, if, if you are missing out on something, it may be worse than as if you overdo something, but both are not good. So we have to weigh them in and basically have uh, metrics that also include other aspects like how much data is needed to achieve a certain output or other costs involved in using a certain AI algorithm. And then once we have it all together on a particular use case, um, we will then go ahead and ev evaluate AI algorithms. So um, to give you an example, we, we had a proposal on um, um, uh, breast cancer data where uh, we would on, on, the, on pictures uh, be able to identify the cancer cells using the AI algorithm. We, we have, it seems that there's a high quality data sets which hasn't been public, so some of it 
will be made public so people understand it and some of it will be undisclosed and we will be able to, for instance, test the identification of uh, uh, cancer cells in these uh, pictures uh, through the uh, assessment framework. You know, you, you, you got this program, you got this framework, uh, you've got this great team in terms of moving forward, uh, you know, the two best organizations to uh, really get their bite behind it as well. You know, but we have all of these people out there in the in the world. And how, so, how can they, uh, the audience, participate? The, the title of the uh, of the group that we have created is, is the focus group, and the focus group is an instrument that the ITU has created to uh, tackle new topics. And uh, one of the aspects of the focus group is that it's open to anyone. Um, anyone can participate, and uh, we have all means of uh, of um, participation so you can attend our meetings you can join our mailing lists uh, you can actually get lots of information through a website and social media and the whole process is open and transparent so that everybody can understand how we arrived at the end of our uh, at the end at our documentation um, for a specific use case for example and how we arrived at the uh, assessment framework and then what are the timelines and milestones desired? So at, at the last meeting, uh, we issued a draft call for use cases and data. So then I hope that we will get some uh, indications of use cases coming in um, and also understand better how the data uh, resources are that will be made available to us. Based on that and based on some other discussions on what are we going to do and, and, and how are we going to technically also do the evaluation. We would at the next meeting in November issue uh, the call uh, for use cases and data. And then if we receive input by January at the EPFL meeting, we will then be evaluating this data. And uh, uh, by the March meeting, and we could actually, if things go well, have first results by May. And at May, we are planning to meet with the AI for Good Summit in Geneva, where in May this year, uh, the whole thing was born. So it will take until May 2019 full circle to actually hopefully provide a first result of our evaluation. Yeah, no, it's interesting. The AI for Good Summit uh, is really has made history. It's, it's grown each year, founded in 2017. It was even bigger in 2018. In 2019, we expect it to even double beyond that. So and you have all of these UN agencies, 33 contributing this year, over 50 global media and participants from every domain uh, actively involved. And in fact, even though the audience was pretty notable as well, just for, uh, there to watch. So with the 148 speakers, uh, it's a great venue uh, to target to the main meeting of the AI for Good Summit. It's Pretty interesting. So it's not only the talks that are interesting at AI for Good, but it's also the crowd that's there. So the breaks are as interesting as the talks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, the networking and that the side of hallway stories are compelling. Now, where can people go to find out the whole story of this initiative? Well, we, we are in the process of creating lots of documentation. So we have written a, a white paper, which might be a good start to understand what's going on. The, the website is available. Maybe you can, when you post this, uh, put uh, at the website link uh, so that people find it there. But you can also just search for the term AI4H and you'll find already quite some amount of resources um, to read what we are doing. And again, if you want to participate, uh, we are open uh, for those who want to constructively contribute uh, uh, to, for them to participate. You know, you, you, you got this open uh, program where anybody can contribute. So what resources does the focus group need to achieve success? Well, to start with, we need data, health data in particular. We need some of them to be open and some of them to be non-disclosed. That is not easy. Uh, but there are quite a few um, research projects and other projects that have produced such data. So I hope we're going to get strong submissions. Then once we have the data, we also need AI algorithms that will help us to actually do what we are set out to do. <laughs> then we need people that are devoted to the cause of bringing AI for health to the global scale. And with that, uh, you know, have AI do real good. 
and uh, the people need to have an expertise that you know is, we need to have health professionals that have medical biological knowledge uh, we want to need we need engineering uh, experts uh, computer science ai etc we need people that are good at data signal and image processing and then last but not least we also need financial su support because lots if this grows we will have the need for staff to help we might need some we do need some hardware uh, for the group's operation the data handling the evaluation and also the promotion so lots of support is needed to make this work this program really re resonates among so many different constituents out there. So what are the outcomes and why should each of these constituencies care? Well, let's, let's go one, one, one by one, one. So, so healthcare. Um, so for healthcare, I think it's important to make AI a useful tool in public and clinical health. And um, what we are providing here is maybe a solutions that provide support for health workers and we also could this way address pressing issues such as the shortage of health workers that may lead to no health care at all in some countries or long waiting times in other countries and this way where when the health workers can concentrate on other aspects that can be covered with the AI solution for example they can actually um, do a better job on those aspects. So we could actually inc increase the quality of healthcare. The next constituency you might want to look at is government. The government know that we, they need to do something about the digital story of health, but what and how and what's the method. So what we could maybe help them with is to provide data for tangible action for digital health. And we may also at the end help them to also not only increase the quality of healthcare, but also lower the cost of healthcare at the same time. Business, industry, well, if you think about it, um, you are building your AI algorithm in your, let's say, startup company, in your big company. Uh, you want it to be used uh, to create a business. How do you go from your Series A type of system even series B to worldwide adoption. Well, uh, AI for Health could be that possible roadmap to worldwide adoption for your AI for Health solution. And then once it's adopted, you can make it even better. A constituency would be academia and researchers. So you would basically have a worldwide recognition of your contributions to use cases to the data and the algorithm. And also, again, whatever you have created in your research could uh, end up uh, being adopted worldwide. And so this will be interesting. Um, we have the United Nations, the, the one that stop the people that support the sustainable development goals. Um, I think this activity addresses many pressing problems that are expressed by the SDGs and uh, I hope that uh, it will help there for citizens, obviously, better healthcare in terms of quality, cost, accessibility, usability, speed. Sometimes you want quick help and you don't get it. So speed for AI for health is, uh, is a big, big argument as well. And then for entrepreneurs, um, this, the whole AI for health topic uh, receives lots of investment. Now, I think this strengthens uh, the investment situation and it provides a tremendous opportunity for you to basically also take into account this activity. And then you could also, with your existing venture, uh, look into uh, uh, how you move it further uh, uh, in terms of uh, deploying your solution. Um, and if you are investing in this space, well, you could leverage on this focus group to bring your current venture to the next level and uh, have it evaluated uh, and have some approval uh, through legislature and then have potentially large adoption. And, um, and this may also spur additional founding of AI for health com companies because uh, maybe this contributes to their exit story. And last but not least, if you are foundation, well, 
you are supporting an activity that is aimed for good, that is aimed to help people, that aims to improve a very important part um, of our life. Um, it also uh, helps, you, you will also help to bring the AI topic um, in the health area from a promise that is being made quite often to reality because we will be uh, telling what these algorithms are good for and how good they are performing. And then you can also, you know, push us maybe also to insist on topics that are helping the poor children and those that need the most as well. So because they should be in the focus of our group here as well together as with many, many other of those applications. So, yeah. I think uh, there's something in for almost everybody. Well, you actually name every group. <laughs> so uh, definitely a lot of value add to be shared uh, throughout the world and through all the different stakeholders and communities. Now, there's a lot of work to be done. It's going to be completed. What happens after the focus group completes its work in 2020? Well, I, I agree with you. We first have to show credibility. We first have to... Uh, show that what what we want to achieve is achievable, and then many things can happen. I think that uh, um, uh, the, the sky is the limit if we do things right. Well, you know, Thomas, you're you're chairing this uh, amazing initiative. You've uh, have always laid out a vision that can resonate through so many different communities, but also support the UN and government and industry and academia. And I thank you for coming in today and just sharing your deep insights and also your commitment, your dedication, your passion to make a difference. Thank you very much.